So there's a, in the, the deep subcutis, there's kind of a multi-nodular um, proliferation of, looks like, kind of endothelial cells with some blood spaces, kind of dilated. Um, it looks like there's kind of this background cellularity to of these more spindle cells. So yeah, there's, like you said, there's some cavernous spaces and that's what we're seeing here. We got blood and, and some serum and these dilated and cavernous just means big open spaces, right? Often with thin walls. That's when we say cavernous. That's basically what that term means. It's just big and open, like a cave or like a cavern. And um, sometimes you can see these little bubbles protruding into the serum. You can see that in this entity, but in lots of different vascular things, it's, it's kind of normal to see uh, endothelial kind of vacuoles that have protruded out and, and pushing the um, that serum out of the way. And then in addition to that, um, the cavernous areas, we also see background that are kind of more cellular spindle cells, right, with some blood between them. And let me go over to another area over here. This doesn't look as cavernous. This is more like kind of almost solid nodules that are cellular. Both spindly here on the left and also kind of epithelioid looking here on the right. So uh, do you have ideas how we put all this together? What What is this, this thing so, called? Yeah, all together this would fit for a spindle cell hemangioma, but it does look pretty revved up and kind of scary. Yes, that's why it's good to know about this entity because it looks kind of scary if you don't know what it is. Once you know what it is, it's a very characteristic lesion that's easy to recognize and diagnose, usually on H&E. Um, if you really, I mean, to me, the only other thing that could kind of look like this would be maybe Kaposi sarcoma. But I would tell you that I have, I mean, Kaposi sarcoma is not as common nowadays, thankfully, because um, uh, AIDS is not as common in, in our practice setting, at least because of uh, antiretroviral therapies. So um, we don't see Kaposi's nearly as often because we don't see uncontrolled HIV as often. But in the cases of Kaposi I've seen, I don't think I have personally ever seen a case of Kaposi present as a subcutaneous nodule without dermal involvement. Essentially all the Kaposi's I've seen start in the dermis. They may get down to the subcutis, but they are basically dermal centered or dermal beginning processes with the exception of rare cases where I've seen like lymph node Kaposi's and stuff like that. But to present as a solitary nodule down in the sub Q is not a typical Kaposi sarcoma presentation. But if you got any doubt, HHV8 stain will be negative here and will solve this problem uh, for you. Um, this, this tumor, spindle cell hemangioma, um, most of the time when I've seen it, it has been a single or multi-lobulated subcutaneous nodule, although it can sometimes occur in the dermis. And in those cases, it can uh, bear more close resemblance to Kaposi sarcoma. And Kaposi can have dilated cavernous areas. It can have spindle cell areas like we talked about earlier. It can have epithelioid looking cells sometimes. Kaposi can have a lot of different patterns and flavors. So if there's any doubt, again, do the HHV8 stain. But what we usually see for, for spindle cell angioma is from one, from low power, it's often a nodular or multinodular subcutaneous mass, and it tends to be biphasic. You have dilated cavernous vessels. This one looks very busy also because there's so much blood in it. Sometimes when I see them, the blood is kind of washed out more during processing and is not so like abundant. So the blood here, I think, makes this look very, very busy and, and it uh, gives it a more scary appearance to our eye. But even without the blood, it's we see cavernous areas, but then we see solid cellular spindled areas and epithelial areas. That generally makes us worry. When we see a vascular thing with solid areas, we feel afraid because there are a variety of bad things that do that, right? And it's not as often to see solid areas in benign um, uh, vascular things. So um, the I, I think it's important to bring up that in the spindled areas, the spindle cells are elongated, kind of vague, fascicular, intervene with some compressed channels, some of which look slit-like, kind of like Kaposi, okay, a little bit. But also, I think the name doesn't really um, imply the fact that usually we will also see epithelioid areas as well as the spindled areas. So I would say this is common finding, not like a rare exception. Usually there will be some sheet-like or apparent sheet-like nodular epithelioid plump endothelial cells. Again, even though this looks solid, if we do an endothelial marker here, 31, CD31 or ERG, 
we will see that there are actually nice well-formed vessels. They're just packed very closely together and many of the lumens are kind of obscured because they're squished against one another, as is often the case in vascular tumors that have epithelioid cells like epithelial hemangioma. It looks like they're solid and then on immunostains for vascular markers, you see there's actually much more organization and well-formed pattern here um, than we thought. They're not really sheet-like, okay? The, um, the cells are plump, but they are pretty bland, and they don't have uh, much in the way of mitotic activity or uh, pleomorphism or atypia, okay? Um, the, oh, the other thing I was going to bring up is this is a, an entity where CD34 is often negative in, in much of the lesion, which is an interesting uh, phenomenon, that even though these are vascular, they often do not express CD34 or have big zones that are CD34 negative. Yet another reason that I don't love using CD34 as a vascular marker in general. I actually, uh, uh, my resident Rahil Rizwan was the first person who showed me an article in the literature from, from years ago actually that said this. I just had not, I had not really stained these very often because usually if you get a nice sample, they're pretty recognizable once you're aware of their features. So I had not stained them and I don't use CD34 that often, so I wasn't aware of this feature. Maybe I, maybe I skipped that day of fellowship, I don't know. Um, I'm looking for one other feature that I like in this entity. These are relatively rare. You don't, you don't tend to see these as often, although I've seen a run of them in, in the past few years for some reason. Uh, before that, it, it would be several years between times that I would encounter these. Um, they are benign, but they tend to be multi multifocal. So you can have multiple nodules in the same extremity, like uh, on the right leg, for example, or the arm. You know, tend to be the ex extremities of adults, and they they can be multifocal, and they can arise out of the wall of a vein, and they can even extend into and fill the lumen of a vein, of a vein. And so that uh, uh, built that growth into the lumen of a pre-existing large vein, and the fact that they can be multifocal or multinodular in the same limb can make them look very scary clinically, right? That presentation clinically, intravascular growth and multifocality, sounds like you've got something that's beginning to metastasize. And that's why in the 1980s, when Dr. Weiss and colleagues um, described this, they thought at first that it was a type of intermediate malignant potential vascular lesion, a, and they called it spindle cell hemangioendothelioma. But when they followed those same patients up over a decade later, none of them had any progressive disease. So these can be multifocal and they can recur, but usually after many years and not in an aggressive fashion. So they are now renamed as spindle cell hemangioma, but I think it's worth knowing that they can be multifocal and that that's not at all an indication of malignancy here. What I was trying to find was that endothelial vacuoles sometimes clump together and look like little tiny fat cells crushed in the middle of the cellular zones, but I am I'm having trouble finding it. I've got a really nice example of that on my uh, Kiko index, a digital slide of that. Um, and it's, it's not always present, but when you find it, it is very characteristic of spindle cell hemangioma. And I am just not seeing it here, so I guess I'm going to let it go. This one does have a vein in the middle of the lesion. I'm guessing that that probably is what the, the, the lesion arose out of this vein probably here. See, there's this big muscular vein here. But I can't see it growing into the wall of it, but I, I've seen that before. I think that the case on Kiko that has the nice vacuoles also has nice growth right into and, and through the wall of an adjacent muscular vein, a really, really pretty example that you'll, I think, look at and think it has a lot of overlap with the case we're looking at here. So benign and beautiful, spinal cell angioma. And what is the syndrome? These are, when I see these, they're usually sporadic, but there is an association with a certain syndrome. And what's that? Mafuji syndrome. Mafuji syndrome, where people have IDH1 or IDH2, usually IDH1 germline mutations, and then um, they develop multiple enchondromas of bone as well as spindle cell hemangiomas, and they have a higher risk of developing chondrosarcoma of bone as well. Um, and then also I was just informed the other day that Klippel-Trenani syndrome is supposedly can have spindle cell hemangiomas in it as well. I've, I've seen a couple patients with Klippel-Trenani and all the things I saw in them looked like big vascular malformations, but I don't recall ever personally seeing a spindle cell hemangioma, but I've been told it's, it's reported as an association. So in any case, and even the sporadic spindle cell hemangiomas usually have mutations of IDH1 or IDH2. So if you're struggling on a case, you can send it off for molecular testing uh, to find uh, that malformation. And if you happen to have the IDH1 immunostain in your lab, like for, for staining gliomas, my understanding, if I recall correctly, is that the locus of the mutation or the, the mutation is actually a different than the glioma mutation. And so the immunostain does not usually work on these. Even when they're IDH1 mutated, the IDH1 immunostain is usually not going to stain them. 
That is my understanding. I've tried it a couple times just to see, and it came out negative, even on cases that we ended up later sending for molecular testing and were positive on molecular. So I think that's probably true that at least the at least the formulation that I've had in my laboratory of IDH immunostain has not been helpful in identifying these. But again, with uh, with uh, practice, these are pretty recognizable in H and E.